what this means is I could make a machine, a flying saucer, and yes, I, I could you know, achieve speeds of just under the speed of light, but uh, I'm not altogether sure that would get me to the nearest star, <laughs> which I understand. I'm not into so, uh, star physics, but it's three or six light years away. Uh, it might we might be able to do it in the future if we can you know use cryogenics to freeze down the body and so on because it would be six years there and six years back at the speed of light i mean this raises the question of if i believe in god which i do and and this uh this universe around us why did god create the stars if we can never go there well we can go there and this is explained in the, in the second half of the book on the science of god and, but we, we can't go there carrying our physical body. So we've got to wait till we're dead. Then the soul is released from the body. And then the soul can visit these different star systems because we, the soul can travel. The soul is electromagnetic energy. The soul is voltage. The soul, the soul can travel beyond the speed of light. So that I'm convinced that there is life on other planets and other stars but that the only way to get there is not to travel in, in the 70 years that we get, but the only way we can do it is wait until the soul leaves the body, and then the soul will transmigrate, possibly to another star system, and reincarnate as another living being on that galaxy or wherever. Okay, but, well, uh, that's, that's, that's quite a bit to chew on. Let's, let's be, before we get to that, I, I want to stick with something uh, closer to home here back to this craft, the idea of creating craft that could do this or that, anti-gravity craft. Has someone else mastered this? Is there a black project that's figured this out? Is somebody got it in a hangar somewhere? Could it be the UFO knots, whoever they are, wherever they're from, have figured this out themselves, and that's how they, they get here? Absolutely. Uh, not just how they get here. Another uh, consideration, George, is that they could be here all the time. It's just that their frequency of vibration changes. In other words, we can't see them with our eyes, even though they're in front of us, because we can only see certain visible light frequencies. But if somebody, we're all vibrating at different frequencies, every single atom vibrates at a different frequency. Now, it could be that the frequency of uh, the, the alien craft is such that when it's interstellar, it's uh, at a given frequency where, which accommodates travel. But once it gets into the Earth's atmosphere, it could be that the frequency of the vibration of the craft changes, and therefore we are able to see it. It's a bit like seeing ghosts. They're there all the time, but sometimes we can see them. If our vibration changes, if we are particularly uh, upset or depressed or whatever, then we could bring our own atomic vibration to a different frequency, and thereby tune in and see different things in front of our very eyes, which are there all the time, which can't normally be seen. So it's all a question of frequency rather than uh, has somebody, well, excuse me, I, I, I'm trying to answer the question, but there are two sides of the question. <laughs> One is, have they done it? And I'm saying, yes, they have, but we can't see them. And uh, the second side of the question is, uh, it, it, can we, it, would it help us to make a machine to go the speed of light? And I don't believe it will because we would disintegrate. What you know, about time travel? What about using this incredible energy to travel through time? I mean, if, if uh, you can generate gravity, you can bend space and time. Could you bend sp time enough to where you can travel through it, in essence? Well, no, George, you can't have it both ways. If you have it my way, you don't start bending time. <laughs> I mean, this idea of Einstein's of a big rubber sheet in the sky is just nonsense. There is no such thing as space-time. Relativity is nonsense. Quantum physics is nonsense. I mean, it has to be. It's not even scientific. Quantum uh, physics is a probability-based physics. Um, uh, science is not based on probability. It's based on specific, uh, uh, measurable relationships between different... Uh, physical phenomena like magnetism and, and uh, electricity and so on. So it's nonsense. You can't, you can't even begin to go there. So you can't have it both ways. You can't start bending universes and have multiple universes. What I've shown in my book is you don't need any of that. All you need is a proton and an electron. You can start the whole universe. And I've even shown where the proton and electron derive from the genison, which is the original particle. I've called it the genison. It has to come from one single particle. So there, is no, there are no loose ends. And every step of the book has been substantiated using scientific uh, evidence of today. Even the gravity and anti-gravity has already been done by scientists at Yale University, but they don't know what they're playing at. 
they've been trying to move electrons uh, in, using nano electronic devices they can't, they can't make tweezers small enough to move the electrons in their integrated circuits so they've been firing helically polarized light at the, at the particles and they can move them to the left and move them to the right so they've already discovered them but they don't know what they're doing they're moving electrons for the purpose of manufacturing integrated circuits or microchips to go into uh, mobile telephones they have no idea that they've discovered gravity and anti-gravity and all they did was once they had the gravity they passed it through a phase change of 180 degrees to produce the anti-gravity they passed it through a delay line a transmission line so every single step of what i've said in the book has already been scientifically proven I can guess how you're going to answer this question, but what about the concept of entanglement? Uh, what uh, Einstein referred to it as the, the spooky connection between particles that are uh, at great distances. And I know what you've already said about particles, but as I recall, and I, my, my understanding is very basic, but the, uh, as I recall, that had been demonstrated empirically that there had been some sort of a connection. You're, you're dispute yeah, that, you, of course. You mustn't take this empirical stuff seriously, George. <laughs> I mean, they've said they've empirically uh, uh, shown that the, the antineutrino exists, but I've shown it can't. Now, they've said that the antineutrino is inside every neutron. In other words, it's like a boiled egg. A boiled egg has a shell, a white, and a yolk. And they've said a neutron has a half a positive, half a negative, and an antineutrino. And they said, isn't it strange that if you smash them apart in a particle generator, that the, the, the small positive one sticks around, that the small negative one sticks around, but isn't it strange that the one in the middle disappears completely? Well, you know, the conservation of energy says nothing disappears. <laughs> now, if it disappears, it meant it never existed in the first place. Um, and that's what I mentioned earlier, that a neutron is made from half an electron and half a proton. And the, the antineutrino, which they say that they've seen from printouts from particle accelerators, is not a particle. It's a corridor of fusion, the same as you get in a diode. When you join a positive material to a negative material in a diode, you get a corridor of fusion, which separates the two charged areas. That's all it is. You could say a spark is a particle. A spark is not a particle. Just because you can see it and just because it might give you a shock, it doesn't mean it exists. A spark results due to the differential of voltage difference between two mediums or two metals, if you like, and it, it simply the, the voltage breaks down the intervening air and a spark flows through the atoms in the air. That's all a spark is. You can't say a spark is, an, is a particle because it's not. So when they say we've seen these particles, this guy's wrong. It's not like that. What they're seeing is the interaction between the proton and the electron, and the, the electromagnetic interaction causes phenomena. It gives off light. It causes all sorts of things. And it appears that you're seeing particles, but in fact you're not. They're just manifestations between particles. Okay, well, there are three terms that appear in your book, Future Science, that you usually don't see in a science book. One of them is astrology, another is reincarnation, and the other is God. And you suggest in the book that we are capable of seeing the face of God, that reincarnation is almost certain, as you just mentioned, uh, you know, matter doesn't disappear, it's, it's basically eternal, I guess that would include us. And then your, your findings on astrology and how uh, activity on the sun affects our lives in very practical and demonstrable ways was, I thought, uh, astounding. We're going to get into that, uh, those topics, and then at the top of the hour we'll be opening up the phone lines so that our audience can ask you questions. Um, and, man, we've still got a lot of ground to cover. I, I hope this is going okay for you, Maurice. It's fine, George. Thank you. <laughs> but it is a lot to swallow. It is. All right. We'll, we're going to take a break now. We'll come back in our conversation with Maurice Cotterell, author of Future Science, Forbidden Science of the 21st Century, continues.
opinions of other people. Every once in a while, I will take a look at my Aries forecast in the local newspaper here just for entertainment or fun purposes mostly. I never took it too seriously. Maurice Cotterell, though, has studied solar activity uh, for a long time. The same conclusions he reached that allowed him insight into Mayan uh, civilizations and other sun-worshipping civilizations helped him crack the Mayan calendar and uh, gave him insight into his theories of everything, I guess, his insights into physics and other uh, seeming mysteries, uh, gave him some thoughts about astrology, how it does affect our lives, how it uh, affects our lives in demonstrable uh, and and uh, clearly um, uh, provable ways. Maurice, tell me about that part of it. Well, the story for me, George, began when I was on board ship, because when the ship sailed from north to south, everybody was happy. And when the ship sailed from east to west, they started arguing. And they were very unhappy. So I began to consider the fact that something must be affecting the behavior of the people on board. And the only thing it seemed to me could be the magnetic field of the Earth, because north to south we're going in line with the magnetic field, and east to west we were going across the magnetic field lines. So I also, being the radio officer on board, realized that uh, the sunspot cycle interfered with my radio signals periodically. So I started to look at the, how the sun might be affecting human behavior. And the story, the scientific story, anyway, starts around 1927. And at that time, a German psychologist, Johannes Lange, was uh, doing some research on one-egg twins and two-egg twins. And he determined that uh, heredity behavior must be determined by uh, genetic factors. Or behavior must be determined genetically. The next step of the explanation was to uh, unfold in 1958 when James Van Allen uh, put some experiments together on the, sat on the satellite Explorer 1, which discovered two zones of intense radiation around the Earth. The Van Allen belts. The yeah. Van Allen belts, of course. Right. In 1962, Mariner 2 spacecraft detected streams of particles uh, from, coming from the sun, which we now refer to as the solar wind. In 1979, a British astronomer, Professor Ian Nicholson, discovered when the solar wind particles crash into the Van Allen belts, the magnetic field of the Earth in the middle of them changes. He actually says variations in the solar wind produces changes in the Earth's magnetic field that are reflected at ground level. So we can actually feel the changes at ground level. And in 1984, a team of scientists at the Naval Medical Research Institute of Bethesda, Maryland, discovered that magnetic fields from the lights in the, in the uh, laboratory were affecting the manufacture of DNA in test tube baby experiments. So it seemed to me we had a mechanism here, how particles were emitted from the sun, the solar wind, they crashed into the Van Allen belts. Every time they crashed into the belts, the magnetic field changed. When the magnetic field changed, it caused genetic mutations in early impregnated ovum. So all I had to do was to show that the sun gave off 12 types of radiation, which resulted in 12 types of personality. And that's what I did in 1986 when I self-published my first book called Astrogenetics. And that showed, as future science does, how the sun radiates 12 different types of particles throughout the year that cause 12 different types of genetic mutation in early impregnated ovum in the womb, and that causes 12 different types of personality. And then from, uh, from that, I then uh, had a look at how the planets might affect the, uh, the radiation pattern striking the fetus, and what I discovered was that the inner planets, Mercury and Venus, modulate the beam of particles coming off the sun, whereas the outer, part, the outer planets, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, they have the ability to accelerate or decelerate the particles coming off the solar wind. And therefore, the speed at which the particles smash into the, the Van Allen belts and the resulting magnetic field changes. So we don't get 12 completely different uh, types of personality. We get 12 types and we have slight modifications depending on where the planets are. I also and, discovered... And, and it depends on... So where a person is born, when the person is born, can affect the kind of person that they become. Absolutely. It depends on the Earth's magnetic field and the Sun's magnetic field combined. And this is why when we leave our magnetic field from where we were born, the Earth's magnetic field changes 
people behave differently, it affects the hormones in the body, in the brain, and the hormones make us anxious. We call this anxiety homesickness. The same thing happens when we get on a jet aircraft and change through the magnetic fields quickly. The hormones change in the brain and we get jet lag. We, uh, biorhythms, the melatonin hormone, loses synchronization. So, uh, and this is how the pigeon finds its way home and the salmon and creatures like that, migratory creatures. That